this afternoon on the topic of forgiveness. Uh, last Lord's Day in the Catechism that we went through at Living Word in Guelph, where I'm from, uh, was Lord's Day 51 on those words in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So two passages in connection with that. The first, Matthew 18. Matthew 18, the first 14 verses. A lot nearer to the end of Jesus Christ's ministry here in Matthew 18 than where we were this morning in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 18, starting at verse 1. This is God's word. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, a truly I tell you, he is happier about one, that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. It's as far as we'll read in Matthew 18. Also read from Romans chapter 5. Paul's letter to the Romans. verses 1 through 11 of chapter 5. Here we read, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That is Romans 5. To turn then to our confession, uh, Lord's Day 51 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Second last Lord's Day of the 52. Ending on the Lord's Prayer. That 
the different requests in the Lord's Prayer, the different petitions. Lord's Day 51 asks, what is the fifth petition? And the answer, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That is, for the sake of Christ's blood, do not impute to us, wretched sinners, any of our transgressions, nor the evil which still clings to us, as we also find this evidence of your grace in us, that we are fully determined wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbor. Congregation, we have before us the topic of forgiveness, and typically, I think when the topic of forgiveness comes up, people, ministers often read Matthew 18. Although, usually it's not the part that we read this afternoon. Usually it's the second half of Matthew 18, uh, because in the second half of Matthew 18, you get some of those famous passages, the passage of, uh, if a brother sins against you, what should you do? You should talk to him, um, seek uh, for him to repent and change his ways. If he doesn't listen, then you have to go get some witnesses. And if that doesn't work, you get the church involved. Uh, it's a whole path towards discipline if people are not going to forgive or repent or change. But then following that, Jesus has that interaction with Peter where Peter asks, oh, how many times are we supposed to forgive somebody when they, when they repent? You know, a couple times. Jesus says, not seven times, but 77 times seven times. The point being many, many times, as many times as is needed. And then he says that very powerful parable as well of a, a, a servant that was unforgiving um, after having been forgiven a massive debt. The king, he owed the king a huge amount of money, amounts of money that are unheard of today. The king says, fine, you know what? I'm going to let you go. But then he goes off, sees somebody that owes him a small debt, doesn't forgive him, so the king ends up punishing him. And Jesus is trying to say, well, you should be forgiving because you have been forgiven much. And that parable really is a, an accurate representation of what God does for us in forgiving us and how we should respond. But all that discussion in, Roman, or sorry, in Matthew 18 actually comes, first of all, from the presence of some very little children. In Matthew 18... There's some debate about how young these children are. Uh, some argue that they're probably almost close to infants there. Others uh, argue that, well, maybe they're, they're more toddlers because Jesus says, you know, bring them to me. Um, if they could actually come to him, then maybe they could walk, that kind of thing. Uh, he called, sorry, verse 2, he called a little child to him and placed that child among them. So that, that seems like a little bit older perhaps. But regardless, the point that Jesus builds up as he speaks for the first 14 verses of this chapter is that these little ones are loved, cherished, and indeed an example of what it is to be in the kingdom of heaven, even the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And as we consider Jesus' request for us to ask for forgiveness, you actually get a picture of what, you could say, earning forgiveness looks like uh, that's a bad way of putting it, but what, who forgiveness is given to that then directs us in how we ought to start thinking about forgiving others. And that's really the way Jesus tackles this as well in the Lord's Prayer, because what does Jesus do? He first talks about we're supposed to request God's forgiveness of us, but then he has us also think about how we're supposed to forgive others. So we're going to look at it in two parts then. The call to forgive, and then we'll see what God's forgiveness is and what God's forgiveness does. So, first of all, what God's forgiveness is. And there has been a lot of discussion about forgiveness in some recent Christian books. One of the last books uh, that uh, Tim Keller, PCA pastor, he passed away, I think, a couple of years ago, was promoted to glory. But he published a book called Forgive. Uh, maybe, I think Pastor Eric has also... Uh, read that and talked about it at points um, from my conversations with him. Um, uh, not the only one that's been talked about in terms of forgiveness. There was other, another notable book called Unpacking Forgiveness by uh, a man by the name of Chris Bronze that made its way around many uh, circles uh, too. And there was something that those books had in common. They both point out that there's a lot of confusion surrounding forgiveness nowadays, especially when you hear news reports of communities that 
have a, a tragedy happen, like a school shooting in the US. Um, one example was in an Amish community, and the Amish community said that they forgave the shooter, and everything's okay, even though the, the shooter, and they, there was no signs that he was sorry for what had happened. Is that forgiveness? Is that what we're called to do as Christians? And then we think of uh, our culture right now where governments are attempting to ask for forgiveness and reconciliation for things that previous governments did in the past uh, to different races or people groups. The question comes up again, is this legit? Is this actual forgiveness? Is, is this actual reconciliation? Is that possible? And of course, pastoral cases, living in a community, people sin against each other. And so often that can become a struggle. Do I have to forgive this person? They haven't done anything to deserve forgiveness. Somebody told me I should forgive them and stop holding grudges, but it still hurts so bad. And on top of that, they, they haven't even shown that they're sorry for what they did. They're not even admitting they did any wrong. Well, when Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. He's obviously connecting how we forgive others to how God forgives us. In fact, Ephesians 4 verse 32 directly says it. Forgive others as God in Christ forgave you. So the best way to figure out how we're supposed to forgive one another is to take a look at what God does to us. Now, in the midst of all the discussion on forgiveness, a lot of different terminology can be used for what God does when he forgives. Uh, and it's actually, I've found in discussions on forgiveness, the terminology can get in the way of actually the meaning of forgiveness. So I'm going to split how God forgives into three parts. Uh, some people have argued that the biblical word forgive only means one of those parts. Uh, some say it means the, the first two parts. Others say uh, it's, it's all of the parts. We're, we're going to take the, all the three parts as a whole. It, and the tricky part, why, why it gets so controversial, is that the Bible can use the word forgive in some of these different ways. It doesn't always use it in the same way, and it's not always clear which way it's using it. That, that's all a preamble to the three parts, which are the offer of forgiveness, the transaction of forgiveness, and the restoration or reconciliation of forgiveness. The offer, the transaction, the restoration. We'll start with the offer. There is a difference between offering forgiveness and actually going through with the transaction of forgiveness. Think of, think of what God does for a moment. God offers forgiveness freely to all. And it costs him a lot to make that offer. How far does God go to make sure that that offer is real when he says, I, I, I want to forgive you. Repent and believe. How far does he go? Well, Romans 5, we read it, tells us how far God goes, and the timing is important. Uh, it says, uh, we, we read that, I think it was Romans 5, verse 6. Uh, you see, at just the right time, says Paul, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And we know the logic there. Uh, he goes on to say, you know, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. So if you were asked to die in order to keep someone else alive, you might ask the question, well, well who is it? Like, I'm going to give my life here, so... Uh, Hopefully this is a person I know, a friend that I'm going to save in some way. I mean, people debate whether or not they will give a kidney in order to save another person's life. That's not giving their whole life for them. But it's a nice thing when they're able to do it. Uh, apparently uh, there was a, either an experiment or a survey where people were asked whether they would accept a million dollars if it would mean that someone somewhere randomly in the world would die. And a large number of people actually ended up saying, well, in their heart of hearts, yeah, probably, because they wouldn't know who it was and it wouldn't affect them. It's part of our human nature to be very much looking out for me, myself, and I. It would be very rare for even a good person to die for another good person. That's Paul's point. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Okay. Okay. 
So maybe you can find an example of that somewhere. But what does God do? Verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And later in verse 10, we're described as God's enemies. Enemies. That's how far God loves us. That while we're enemies, he sends his son to die for us. We're powerless, it says. We are weak. We were unable to do any good. Like those children that Jesus put forward in Matthew 18, they, they, they're not able to offer much for the kingdom, yet they're the greatest in the kingdom. They're unable to do anything, but that's exactly what God wants from people because that's when he comes to them and says, I'm going to help. And they're actually sinners. They're, they're enemies. They're kicking and screaming. They don't want anything to do with God. And God comes to them and offers forgiveness to them. And, and he goes so far as to pay the cost for the forgiveness for us in the hopes that we would receive it. You think of Jesus on the cross. He's on the cross and he's, he's in torture. He's being mocked. He's being crushed by the weight of people's anger and hatred towards him and more especially the father's forsaking of him. But he says on the cross to those who are putting him on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He's offering their forgiveness while they're still his enemies while they haven't done anything to say well maybe we should take him off maybe we shouldn't have done this he was dying for them seeking a way for them to be forgiven and that's how god approaches each one of us he, we've done nothing we were his enemy we didn't want him we're in blatant rebellion against god and god said i'm going to send my son to die for you and suffer hell for you he does all of that before we even look at him. And that's the offer. That's the offer. Uh, another theologian and Christian counselor, David Powelson, has called it attitudinal forgiveness. It's the attitude required to be able to forgive. You wouldn't make that offer if you weren't ready. Because in order to make that offer, you have to pay already. You have to be able to say, for, if somebody stole your car, cracked it up, and came to you and, and like, I, I broke your car. I'm sorry. It, it's going to cost a lot. I can't afford anything. Um, maybe, maybe they don't even say sorry. Maybe they, like, they try to hide it, and, and then you find out. For you to forgive them, it's going to cost you. But in order to offer that forgiveness, you have to be willing to pay all of that, all of what it's going to cost you up front to say, no, I, I'm going to pay for all the damage. I'm going to get it fixed. Um, to offer that, you have to have that attitude first and that willingness to pay. And the Bible makes it clear that that's what happens when, when God comes to us. He has already shown his willingness, his ability to offer, because he already sent his son. And his son died. So that offer, I, I distinguish that from the transaction the transaction is where not only the, the cost has been paid in the offer given, but the person actually says yes to it, and the record is wiped clear. And the reason I make that distinction is because some people will not say yes to that offer. God is not forgiving everybody in this world, in this universe. Uh, Jesus himself in the Gospel of Luke at one point says, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Luke 17, verse 3. You notice it says, if he repents, forgive him. There's a condition there. That means if he doesn't repent, then what? Then it, then it, it seems like you, you don't have an obligation to forgive him. But that's why the distinction is so important. Because that transaction to forgive, when we think about how God works, how he forgives us, repentance is, is part of what a person who has faith will do. They, they won't be avoiding their guilt. They won't be laughing about all the sins that they're doing. No, they'll be grieving. They'll be crying. They'll be torn up at the cost that their sin has made. And God says, no, it's, it's, I've, I've offered you this already. Here it is. But the transaction doesn't happen until somebody actually opens up their hand to receive it. And if they don't open up their hand to receive it, they, they don't get the forgiveness that was offered. 
can think of Acts 2, verse 38, where people have been cut to the heart and are asking, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Repentance and forgiveness go together. But again, that, that's the transaction part. For God to actually offer us that forgiveness in the first place is, is a separate thing that he's doing which we'll come back to in our second point in terms of what we're supposed to do. So offer, transaction, people receive it, and their record gets wiped clean. Uh, the third part is what follows, restoration, or again, reconciliation. That's when the relationship, where there was sin in that relationship, it's able to become healthy again with the guilt wiped away, with trust restored, and joy and happiness is able to be experienced. And for our relationship with God, we're told that that can happen immediately. It's not like, you know, God, I've broken your trust and now I have to rebuild your trust again. No, God can see inside our hearts. He can tell when repentance is sincere and leads to change. So through Christ, he looks on us with grace and can say, no, your record is clean. With you, I am well pleased. The relationship is restored. And that's how God forgives. He goes through those three parts with us. He offers it. The transaction happens as we receive it, and then he restores the relationship. And you know as well as I that there are some people who will not repent, who even though God has already sent his son to die for them and paid the cost in that sense, you could say, Jesus said to the Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. There are some who will not repent, who will go to their grave kicking and screaming, trying to get away from God and will never believe, never grieve. And so even though Jesus prayed that for them, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, the Father might say, because they never repented, no. I, I've paid the cost for them. It's ready for them. It's sitting there, ready for them to accept it. But they never did. And that's why when we pray, forgive us our debts, we, we must realize the significance of that. Those aren't empty words. We shouldn't just have that when we're, we shouldn't do this with any part of the Lord's Prayer, but uh, when we go through the Lord's Prayer and say, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors, we shouldn't just add that to our prayer as a little checkbox to make sure that we, we got that in. You know, I, I prayed to God and I almost forgot to ask for forgiveness. Oh, good thing I got that in. Uh, no, there should be sincere repentance when we're asking for forgiveness, real grief for our sins. If you don't have any grief, any remorse, how can you be sure that you actually believe in Jesus? If, if there's no grief in your heart for sin, there's, there's no love in your heart for the Savior who died to get rid of it. But on the other hand, God, God is so willing to forgive, so loving of you as one made in his image, that he did give his one and only son for you. And think of, think of the little ones that, that Jesus welcomed in Matthew 18, the little ones that he would risk everything to go after in order to bring them back in that uh, thinking of the lost sheep. Uh, think of how it is, it is their humility, their, their neediness, their low position, their acknowledgement that they can't do things on their own, that, that they're not great. That's what leads to Jesus saying that they are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's not like we need to start measuring how powerful or dramatic our repentance is in order to earn forgiveness. No, when Jesus puts the little child in front, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, he's pointing out that they already need him. They know they're helpless, and they depend on God for help all the time. Forgiveness, you could say, belongs to such as those. And we should have that same humble attitude of a child towards our Heavenly Father. And when we do have that humble attitude, it affects our relationship with others. It's the second point, what God's forgiveness does. And this, it is, I don't know if you ever realized that, but this has got to be the hardest petition to sincerely pray. God, forgive me as I have forgiven others. Which is to say, if, if I'm withholding forgiveness from somebody, then we're saying to God, God, you can withhold forgiveness from me just as much as I'm withholding it from that person. 
why, why would, you know, I almost wonder why would we ever pray that? That's extremely dangerous. We don't forgive perfectly. We don't have a, a perfect attitude of forgiveness. It's one of the reasons why uh, when we read it actually this morning in Matthew 6, when Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer, you notice that he immediately has to give a commentary on the fifth petition because m people must be struggling with the fifth petition. And he says, no, this is the way it is. God is going to forgive you, um, but you need to also have a, an attitude of forgiving others. He has to explain it immediately afterwards. Now, the catechism helps us with this because how does it put it? It says, don't, don't impute to us, wretched sinners, any of our transgressions, nor the evil which still clings to us. So the first part fits with what we talked about in terms of the, the transaction of forgiveness. God is going to not impute to us any of our transgressions. That, that's good. But then notice where the catechism goes. It says, as we also find this evidence of your grace in us, that we're fully determined to forgive. That grace there, is, we also find this evidence of your grace in us. Uh, that grace there is God forgiving you. God forgives you, and when he forgives you, that forgiveness starts giving off all kinds of evidence, gives off all kinds of proof. It's almost like God's forgiveness of you leaves all kinds of fingerprints behind all over you so that the detectives have no problems finding it. And what are those fingerprints? Those fingerprints are you forgiving others. And that's why the, the second point is called what God's forgiveness does. It leaves all this evidence of his grace in us that leads to us being willing to forgive. And it's going to be the same kind of forgiveness that God gave to us. All three parts. The willingness to offer. Going as far as paying the cost in order to offer. Then following through on the transaction when somebody actually says, yes, no, I want that forgiveness. And working on reconciliation. Of course, that all those three steps seems like a tall task. Forgiveness hurts. It comes at a huge cost. It doesn't, it doesn't seem deserved to give forgiveness to some other person. They cause me a lifetime of unhappiness and sorrow and pain and trauma and, and they don't have to repay me at all for all that they took from me and I'm just going to forgive them and accept that? When you think of those Amish people offering forgiveness to a shooter that shot himself and died, he cannot show any sort of repentance at that point. You, sure, you can, you can uh, offer forgiveness and you're going to have to pay the cost. You can't actually get him to pay the cost anymore. How do you work with that? Well, think... Think about what God does for you. God comes after you. God delivers up his son for you. Jesus suffers eternal wrath. God's forsaking him for you. When you've done what? Nothing. When you've contributed what uh, to the cause? Nothing. When you've started turning back to God and saying, God, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit sorry for this. No, even before that, God sent his son and God paid the cost. And that means that we're called to offer forgiveness even while people are still our enemies, even are called to be so ready with that offer that we've basically paid the cost already. We have in our mind this person is going to not be able to pay a nickel for this. I'm that willing to forgive. And then whether they repent or not, that's not ultimately our problem. That, that's God's problem. Because I, I know there are some people that have been hurt so bad and the, the person that hurt them is not a stitch sorry for what they did. And that, that gets in their way and it haunts them and, and it haunts their hearts for the rest of their lives. Or it can. And, and they come up against this and they say, well, I don't have to forgive them because they're not showing any repentance. But that's where this offer comes in. 
because God looks at us the same way. We're not showing any stitch of repentance and he offers and he goes the whole way in giving his son. And then if they don't repent, it is true. God's justice will come. But if they do, how much more joy in heaven for anyone that is lost that now realizes their helplessness and sin comes back like a child to God, humbly seeking his grace. We leave it with God. God will sort things out in his justice. What we are called to do is, is have that attitude of forgiveness and be willing for them to one day be made right with God, but leave that with him. Whether or not the transaction takes place and restoration can happen, those are separate things. Uh, if it does take place, then restoration can be a process. It's not going to happen immediately in this life. There are times where it, it probably will be prevented from happening. There are some people who need to almost pay for and offer that forgiveness when the person has already died. Be, have that attitude of forgiveness towards them, leaving it with the Lord for whatever, because restoration is impossible and the transaction is impossible. But it's key then that if God has forgiven us, there will be this evidence of grace in us that we will want to be offering the same forgiveness to others and following through on the transaction when those others repent. And again, God's forgiveness also reminds us that people that don't repent, God will not simply let that go. He does tell us, vengeance is mine, I will repay. But for our part, Paul says in Romans 12, that's fine. That's God's job. Your job is if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. The transaction that really matters belongs to the Lord. And we leave it with him. And so, brothers and sisters, when you meditate on the people that have hurt you in your life, when you think of some of the big things perhaps that have happened, or if you just think of the minor things that happen in either family life or in work life, people do things against you that hurt, that can cost. They can cost you a promotion. They can cost you uh, an evening of, of what you thought was going to be a relaxing evening. They can cost you happiness in all kinds of different ways. But when you realize what you have been forgiven, when you realize the immense amount of sin that you have committed against God, the honor that he deserves compared to the honor that you give, infinitely worse than any sin that we commit against each other here on this earth, that that is washed away through Christ. And when you see the joy that it brings you you can also be praying for, hoping for people to, to repent, yes, but even be so willing as to, to offer, as to pay the cost for what they've done for you, against you. And then we will be more and more looking like little children before God, before Jesus, who, who know they need him and are looking to him for everything. It's not easy to forgive. It's one of the hardest things. Uh, Tim Keller called it a, a kind of, of dying that we have to do because it hurts so much to really give up on what we could have had that has been taken from us. And yet, in Christ, our life is not our own. It's given over to him and it's given over to others in forgiveness. What he has done for us, may we see that coming out in how we forgive others.